All right, picking up where we left off last time, we were talking about benefit administration. That was the last slide. Uh, now I want to talk about who's covered. We'll start there. And the truth is pretty much everybody who's an employee is covered under workers' compensation insurance by law. So if you have employees, you have a legal responsibility to cover them uh, with workers' compensation, and it's the employer who pays for that. Um, yep, there are some exclusions for farm labor and for domestic labor, but those are narrow. Um, and a lot of times you'll even find that those employers will endorse uh, those employees back onto their policy to be covered because you can imagine um, in those situations, you still have possibility of being hurt on the job. Um, and yeah, if you're just part-time uh, casually, um, you know, so we're talking about somebody who maybe earns less than $400 a year, uh, there might be an exception there where you don't have to provide workers' compensation coverage. Uh, but in general, if they're an employee, you do. Um, family members can be excluded. So if you have a family business, you employ members of your family, you don't have to carry workers' comp on them, um, but you still might want to. Um, also, members of your board of directors, you don't necessarily have to carry workers' comp on them. Um, although, again, you, you might want to just to be safe, right? Um, obviously, the exposure there is different. Um, but if the point is to protect the company's assets, um, you, you might want to make sure that uh, that's one place where they're protected. Where you sometimes see people want to use independent contractors instead of employees is because it does change the nature of the employment relationship and then the employment responsibilities. So if I have an employee, I got to pay Social Security tax, Medicare tax. They're paying half of it, too, but I have to match it as the employer. Um, and then on top of that, I have to pay unemployment and workers' compensation. If it's an independent contractor, I don't have to pay any of that. And I don't have to worry about income tax withholding. Um, it's a lot simpler if everybody's an independent contractor for me. But here's the test. Uh, a person's not an independent contractor just because you say so. Um, it comes down to can you control what they do and when they do it and how they do it. If they can control those things, all right, then they're an independent contractor. Right. I hire somebody to fix my faucet. Um, yep. They're going to decide when they're going to do it. They're going to decide how they're, how they're going to do it. They bring their own equipment. Pretty clear they're not my employee. Uh, that's an independent contractor. They have then the responsibility of paying Social Security, paying Medicare, um, dealing with the unemployment taxes and the workers' comp taxes or insurance. I guess that's not technically a tax. Um, it's an insurance premium, but it is something you have to pay. Um, and then they'd have to handle their own income tax liability as well. And then, uh, so if you want to have independent contractors, yeah, there's legitimate reasons to want that, uh, but you don't just get it just because you say so. Um, it truly has to be a situation where they're able to control their own hours, uh, control how they do the job. Um, the more direction you have, the more likely it is that they're your employee and then you carry all the legal obligations that come along with that. Um, yeah, there's situations where you can lease employees or use temporary employees that are actually hired by an agency. And yeah, then you won't have the responsibility of unemployment and workers' compensation and so forth. Um, but the leasing agency will have that responsibility and ultimately you're going to pay for it anyway, right? They'll just bake that into what they charge. Um, because it's a legitimate cost that has to be paid one way or the other. So that's why I say, yeah, that can change who actually pays for the coverage, but it isn't going to change whether or not they're covered. They have to be covered one way or the other as employees. Um, so you will sometimes see leasing arrangement of employees. Um, and the easiest way to understand that is using a temp agency. Um, and uh, that tends to be fairly expensive to meet your labor needs that way. Um, but the advantage is that the agency then has all the reporting responsibilities that go along with that. And yeah, they'll incur the costs and they'll package that in and, and bill that to you and you'll ultimately pay for that as the employer. Okay, because we've got a state system for workers' compensation and every state can potentially be a little bit different, uh, when you have a, an operation that, that spans multiple states, having injuries in different states can make it difficult for you. Uh, what are you required to do? Um, plus, if you have employees that work in more than one state, they can usually choose where they want to file if they get hurt. And obviously, they're going to file in whichever state gives them the more generous benefits, right? Um, so some states have a shorter time limit for uh, benefits than others. 
Um, if, if you're going to get benefits for a longer period of time and you have a choice, well, yeah, you're going to choose the state that has the longer time limit on benefits. Um, what you can't do is file in both states and try to double collect. We won't let you do that. Uh, workers out of the country special situation, and we've got some very limited coverage there for that situation. Um, if you want coverage without a time limit um, across multiple states, you can get that uh, with an endorsement. So again, we've, we've seen every possible employment situation and we have an insurance product that will work for you no matter what your situation is. Um, so it shouldn't surprise you that as in all the other lines we have, we have a wide array of endorsements that exist to try to cover these kinds of situations. Uh, so the book has an interesting question about, well, you know, you've got somebody who works in two different places and then they also tend to drive a truck through many different states. Well, if they get hurt somewhere on that run, they, they could potentially have five or six different states to choose from. And the law usually allows them to choose uh, which state's law they want to apply. Um, and so that's uh, kind of interesting. It's a rare situation, um, but when it comes up, that is something that can create problems. All right, most of the time when people are providing workers' compensation coverage, it's through insurance. Um, so they go out on the market and they buy an insurance product from an insurance company and they're charging whatever price they think is fair and they're competing with the other insurers in the market. So this is a voluntary transaction. Um, that's one way we can do it. Another way to get insurance is through assigned risk plans. So we might have some employees that we cannot get insurance for. Maybe what we do is too dangerous. No private insurer wants to do it. Um, but the law says we have to cover them. When we do that, if we have uninsurable people, high risk people, high risk employees, um, the way we handle that is we assign them to companies and we say, you must cover this group. Even though you didn't want to, you must cover them in proportion to your market share. So if you sell 20% of the workers comp market, 20% of the uninsurable employees, you must insure. Um, and we will assign them to you and we'll say, this guy, he's yours. Um, you have to insure this particular person. Um, that's an assigned risk plan. That's, uh, that's intended to help with what we call the residual market, the uninsurable market. Sometimes we have employer mutuals. Uh, so we might have employers that have decided that they're going to form their own insurance company to handle workers' compensation exposures. They might band together with other uh, employers to create a self-insured group. Um, and that's a possibility to provide workers' compensation. Uh, state funds, we have a couple different ways that can work. Some In some states, the state also sells workers' compensation insurance as a company. And they're competing with all the other companies that are out there. In four states, we have monopolistic workers' compensation coverage, and that means only the state sells workers' comp coverage. You must buy it through the state. Um, for our purposes, Ohio would be the closest, um, but there's four states that do that right now. Um, and so that's a little bit different situation. So the, in Ohio, the only place you buy workers' comp is from the state. Uh, there aren't any private companies selling anything, and the state isn't competing with private companies. They control the entire market. Um, and it uh, is a problem in most states, the, the, the stronger government presence you have. Uh, when you think about the political pressure, right? Political pressure is always, let's keep premiums low. It, well, the tendency for that is to not collect enough to cover your plane, your, your costs. Um, and so those plans often are running a deficit. And in many states, the workers' compensation plans are running a deficit. Um, and that's just the nature of the system. Um, it, it's not uh, politically expedient to be charging more than you need to to build up a surplus. Uh, when politicians say that, they say, wait a minute, you're charging too much. What are you doing? Um, and then they generally keep the premiums low. Uh, so that tends to generally be the outcome. Uh, the stronger state relationship you have, the more likely it is that your program is probably running a deficit, um, which isn't necessarily a terrible thing. Uh, because state budgets can't run deficits forever. They have to be brought into balance at some point. It's also possible to self-insure. So if you think about this, um, all right, you know, I've got 3,000 employees. Well, I can predict the losses from year to year with that big a pool. I don't know who's going to have the losses, but I've been in business for 25 years. I know what my work comp losses are going to be. 
Um, I don't know where they're coming from, but I, I know about roughly the dollar amount. That's going to be relatively consistent from year to year when you have a big pool. That's a lot of large numbers, right? So if I have a big enough uh, group of employees, I don't have to worry that there's going to be one big claim that's going to wipe me out. If I got 10 employees, I got to worry about that one big claim uh, is going to wipe me out. I really can't run a self-insured plan with 10 employees. I'm going to have to pool up with other people through an insurance mechanism, whether through the private market or through a group of other similar employers. Um, but if I'm big enough to stand alone, maybe I can do that. Um, and most of the companies that can do that are doing that uh, because you cut out all the administrative cost of actually running an insurance program when you self-insure uh, because you don't need the risk-bearing function. Although you do have some options as a self-insured group, there's usually stop loss uh, amounts that you can buy. So you can say, well, we'll make sure that no single claim costs us more than $100,000, for example. Uh, or you can get an aggregate stop loss limit and you can say, um, we'll carry a deductible. We'll, we'll pay the first million, but we really can't pay more than that. Uh, so we have a million dollar stop loss built in there in aggregate. Uh, the per claim method is more common. Um, in terms of a stop loss. And if you're self-insured, it's something you might want to think about. Um, and then you can guarantee that no single claim uh, creates a problem for you. All right. Uh, we've been talking about workers' compensation so far, but I want to talk about employer liability. So we mentioned the possibility that the worker gets injured and the spouse sues the employer for the injury. Uh, well, it wasn't really supposed to be that way. It was supposed to be the exclusive remedy was workers' compensation. But workers' compensation doesn't compensate people who aren't the employees. So if there is collateral damage, and those are very real damages, um, my spouse gets injured and she did most of, at, at work and she did all the at-home childcare and all the at-home cooking and now I have to incur costs to deal with that. Um, so I might sue the employer. Well, workers' compensation isn't going to pay for that. That's why we need employer liability. Uh, so there's a form that was developed by NCCI, and uh, it's not supposed to be part of a package. This is not a policy that will be packaged up and included. Uh, this is something that's supposed to stand on its own, and it's usually workers' comp and employer liability. So we package the two together. We got six parts to this policy, part one being work comp, part two being employer liability. Then we got to talk about other states. Um, and then part four is conditions. What do you have to do? Remember, we got three conditions, right? And here it's only going to be two. Normally conditions are notify, cooperate, and then protect property from further damage. So usually those are conditions. They usually fall into one of those three groups. Here we're just talking about you're going to have a duty to notify. You're going to have a duty to cooperate. Um, so all of the conditions are going to flow from that. Um, and then in part five is where they'll talk about uh, the premium. Um, and then we've got additional conditions that we handle separately. On that informations page, that's the, the equivalent of a declarations page. There's a real good example in the text. Um, and it'll show uh, a couple of things on here that are kind of interesting. Um, it's going to incorporate the state statutes rather than listing the benefits because they're different state to state. Um, your premium is charged by class. So every employee that you have is going to be assigned a class to describe the labor that they do. So are they a retail hardware store clerk? Um, in, our exam, in our family business, that was one of our classifications. Another classification was 100% clerical work. So the people who are taking phone calls, people who are doing accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, accounting type functions, that's all clerical work. You're sitting at a desk. Um, and so we're rating that as a class. The people who do that kind of work tend to have certain types of injuries and tend not to have other types of injuries, right? And you can imagine that. Um, the guys who drove our propane trucks, that's a different class. Um, if you're a truck driver, there's a whole bunch of injuries that now you're exposed to that you wouldn't be if you were just a hardware store employee, for example. So we had, uh, in our group, we had four different classes. I've got a little example we'll work through to show you what, what ours looked like. Uh, and I remember this, I was the one who, who was in charge of this in our company. So this is something I feel like I have a really good grasp on. Um, then, okay, so we figure out your class exposure by payroll. So what's your payroll? We've got a rate per dollar in salary for each class. Um, and then we add all that up. And then we apply something called an experience modification factor or just a mod factor. Um, if people are in the industry, that's what they'll talk about. So we're looking at your prior losses. If you've never had prior losses, your mod factor might be less than one. So we calculate a premium and we multiply it by something less than one 
um, that's giving you a discount. If you've had prior losses, you might uh, calculate a mod factor of 1.28. Okay, we're going to take your premium. We're going to multiply it times 1.28, and that's a 20% increase. Um, and that's to reflect past experience. That's an experience mod factor. This is all experience rated, uh, meaning that your past claims are going to influence your future premiums. Um, there's all kinds of discounts that you can get for having active safety programs. Um, there's a, a minimum premium. Um, you might only have two employees, but you still need a policy. And when we rate it, they're clerical employees. So the rate's not very high and you come up with a a $48 premium and the insurance company says, look, we can't be in business uh, selling policies to people for $48. Uh, the minimum premium is 250 bucks. Tough luck, take it or leave it. If you, if you think you can do better somewhere else, do that. Um, so we'll have that and then we'll list an expense constant as well, uh, usually on this information page. So everything's out in the open. Competition um, is actually pretty easy because everybody's using the same class uh, rating factors. Um, so it's uh, pretty easy to see by comparing these information pages uh, where who's most competitive in the insurance industry. It's kind of interesting. Okay, so in part one, workers' compensation, uh, the most important thing we're going to do is promise that we're going to pay the benefits that are required by statute. And if you look on the information page, you won't see a limit listed. Uh, that's because medical benefits are unlimited. It's not legal for an insurance company to say, we're not paying more than $200,000 per case. Uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> um, if that's what it takes, that's what you're going to do. It's unlimited benefits. And that's uh, the statute and how that works. Um, bodily injury from accident and then by disease as long, again, it's subject to the limitation that it arises out of the course of employment. So any accident that happens on the job, that's usually what people think about. Um, people don't spend a lot of time thinking about disease that's caused by exposure that happened on the job. But I mentioned before, COVID-19 is going to be really interesting here. Um, I, again, you're going to have to prove it arose out of the course of employment. And that's the burden of proof is on you as an employee. That's a difficult burden to meet. How do you prove that you contracted the coronavirus at work? How do we know you weren't, you didn't get it from a family member? How do we know? Um, that's going to be a tough thing to prove. Easier to prove, like I said before, if you're a nurse or a doctor and you're bathing in this stuff because you're around it every day, all right, then I believe you probably did contract it from work. Um, but if you're just an average regular person and if you're not working in a place that has a ton of people, it's going to be hard for me to buy um, that you were absolutely 100% exposed on the job. So we're going to have to watch that and see how that works. Has to have occurred within the policy period. Um, and then whatever limits there are, if there are limits, it's the state that dictates those. So like Indiana has a death benefit that's paid out to survivors. So surviving spouse and children, the limit is 10 years. In Indiana, that's what it is. Other states have longer limits. Some states have lifetime limits. Some states will pay death benefits to the survivors up until the normal retirement age. Um, but that's going to be different state by state. Um, and we're not going to have any exclusions listed in part one. Um, and then if there's ever anything in the policy that conflicts with what state law says, yep, you can't have a policy that contradicts state law, state law controls. Um, so if ever there's a conflict there, we're going to have to use what the state law actually says um, to figure out how it's going to be dealt with. All right, we can get one more slide in here. Let's do that. So that's part one. Part two, employer's liability. So Again, it was supposed to be if there's an injury that happens at work, the reason employers signed on to this is because the only recovery the employee gets is through the workers' compensation system. So theoretically, you shouldn't have anything else. That's it. That's the exclusive remedy. Well, it's not broad enough to cover all of the liability. Third-party claim. There you go. Uh, that's what can happen. Um, so you have a third party who's been injured by the fact that the employee is injured at work. And a lot of times you're talking about spouses and children. If somebody's seriously hurt and now the spouse has to spend significant time with in medical care, um, now uh, the spouse can no longer work. They have to care for the injured party first time, full time. Um, yeah, that's not a worker's comp claim. That's an employer's liability claim. Um, coverage has to be in place when the claim actually happened. Let me get back to where we were there. Sorry, got a little excited. You can imagine how that happens. We're, we're still working at part two. 
Um, this is exciting stuff. I tend to I race ahead. I'm so excited. I can't I can't help myself. Um, so same coverage triggers. You have to have employer liability coverage in place at the time of the injury. Um, and then for bodily injury from disease, uh, you'd have to have a policy in effect at least on the employee's last day of exposure to disease causing condition. In other words, um, if we can narrow down where that happened, we can't go back to a previous policy. That's what they're saying here. Um, and that's logical, that makes sense. Um, although maybe not if you're reading the slides. Okay, that's a good place to pause here. We'll pick up with the next lecture uh, on the next slide from here. Thanks.